Hey everyone, welcome to episode 110 of the Nintendo Prime Podcast. I want to thank everyone for joining us, including to my left and your right, Mr. Eric Moore. As always, now we were supposed to have a patron on this week. Corey, get better, my man. I know you're not feeling too well, so hopefully uh, you're feeling better. We do have, uh, I think, two scheduled to come on our next po- podcast. Uh, I do want to uh, just extend a, a, a little apology out to our patrons, uh, especially the $10 and up ones, because we didn't get this out on Thursday when I planned. I was just was slammed, and uh, and then we just nothing really worked out till today. And then um, our $5 patrons, I don't really need to apologize to you because you get to watch this live uh, when you normally don't because you're not getting the audio version today because we're recording right now. So, right. so here you go. Uh, so welcome uh, if you're watching it live or if you're watching it after the fact before I get the full public edited version out. Uh, thank you so much. Obviously, all of you folks that are listening to this after the fact, thank you so much for just stopping by a Nintendo podcast. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, this one's been running for, what, three years, four years? Something like that. It's been, it's been a while, uh, and it wasn't always weekly. So you're like three, four years, <laughs> so only 110 episodes. Like, it wasn't always weekly. Yeah, no, okay? it was it last was, year is when it became weekly. So yeah, it was what maybe monthly the first year or so. <laughs> it, it was that. it was pretty random. I had a different job and yeah, I wasn't really fully dedicated to Hunter Prime. It was just kind of a side gig. But now it's obviously something I'm doing all the time. Uh, so I guess let's just get right into the conversation. This will be a bit of a shorter episode this week. Sorry, I am a little pressed. I have another podcast I'm guesting on, uh, and, uh, that isn't a deprioritize you guys. It's just, I'm trying to get everything in on a very tight schedule over this next week. I have so much content to do. I have some sponsored videos I have to get done. That's right. Sponsored videos. I know you guys are going to start calling me corporate chill. It's not for a video game. So relax. (laughs) Okay. And I don't even do game reviews really. So it doesn't matter. Even yeah. if it was, I mean, whatever. Got to get paid here. Got to get paid. Anyways, <laughs> if you want to do con- something to get paid, if you want the content, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can go to Patreon and support me, but like, obviously, you know, you want to get paid. You gotta, you gotta put in the work for certain things. So, uh, anyways, that being said, the first topic we're gonna talk about, it might be the only topic. We'll see how long it goes. Is Breath of the Wild to wish list? So we know there's a sequel coming. They released a minute and thirty second or so trailer uh, during E3. It's been oh. cross-examined a billion times. Oh. I even did a couple of videos examining some of the, the hidden text or potential hidden text. Uh, so at this point, we both have extensively played Breath of the Wild. That's one game I could definitely say on Switch you have actually put in some time. Oh, yeah. A lot of time. Yeah. Heck, he was putting in more time at E3 this year than I've seen him put in a game in a long time. Yeah. And because Breath of the Wild is just like great. It is. It's my favorite game of all time. Um, so... We have a sequel coming. Now, we've learned a few things about this since uh, it was unveiled, such as it actually was originally DLC. <laughs> so this was, yep. they were working on DLC, obviously the, the DLC we paid for, and then uh, they had a whole bunch of other DLC ideas past what we paid for. And there were so many of them, according to IG Anuma, that he's like, hey, we got to just make a new game. We just got to you know, scrap it, stop trying to make like DLC, let's put all these ideas together and make a brand new game from the ground up. Now he said from the ground up, we all know it's breath of the wild. It's a, he literally called it right. a sequel. So it's the yeah. breath of the wild engine. Yeah. You know, might be slightly improved visuals. Maybe you I, know, I, I hoping think better, was, better frame rate. I think he but, was talking more about ground up from story. Yeah. Story yeah. Wise. I, so I'm going to throw this first at Eric because I've already done a oh, video where I've given some, some thoughts on this and I have like a God, I, I somewhere on my computer. I have a list of like 50 things. Oh, good God. Um, so, Eric, what would you like to see better, different, improved from the original Breath of the Wild in a sequel? Oh God, I don't. Big or small? I don't. I don't even know because I love the game so much. Well, is there anything about the game you wish was oh, different? Oh God. Because this is now it's a sequel. They can do it different this time. Right, right, right. Uh, I know. I know. Me personally, I don't really fully care about this, but I know a lot of people do care about you know dungeons versus shrines. If they could find a different, like a, a maybe a balance of the two, I, I think it's a best of both worlds situation. Um, I don't. I like puzzles, so you know dungeons. I'm. Well, what do you think? What do you think of the divine beast? Because those like were them. the big dungeons in the game. I liked them. Okay. Did you feel they were too similar at all? Uh, certain cases, yes, but I mean not, there was differences. There lava was lava and yeah, water, right, but right, like, right. Design wise, you enter one, you might as well enter all of them. Yeah. They yeah. felt very similar. They the, did. The final did. boss fights, all the, there was different mechanics to them, but the bosses themselves looked right. very similar. Right. Which I get that they were calamities of Gaddon, obviously. Right. But there were some people that were like, 
Yeah, they could have made like, instead of like making we're, them floating. We're used to having versus, like all unique mini bosses yeah. over like twelve dungeons and plus unique final bosses, mm-hmm. and these are all very samey feeling. Mm-hmm. Even beating them, it's like yeah, you shoot the eye in the middle of the helmet, and that's what it is for all four of them. And it's I'm mm-hmm. like right, right. Um, it'd be nice if there was like a different, not just different attacks, but like actual different bosses. Um, and I, again, that comes with I, traditional dungeons. But it fit the story. Sure. I think what happened is Breath of the Wild was in development a long time, but even then, I think what happened is, uh, and the Divine Beasts were, were an idea they've had all along, was that there might have been some more traditional dungeons, uh, but just the time to make it work with the way the world works. like. Mm-hmm. Because when they add dungeons in, if they do dungeons this time, which I know a lot of people are hoping, because some people think Breath of the Wild doesn't even have any dungeons. They don't even count. Because if you've ever played prior Zelda games, especially something like Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, these dungeons, like the Divine Beasts, are like a room in one yeah. of those dungeons. Like it, it's it's they're pathetically nothing. Um, the the amount of puzzles that you do throughout the entire Divine Beast is like one room. Mm-hmm. so it felt very cut back and i know they kept saying oh all the shrines are mini dungeons well like half the shrines are battle shrines which isn't a dungeon, dungeon. at all yeah, no which it's, and that that's it's like the, fighting mini boss but fighting the same mini boss of different difficulty levels right. 60 times right and that that was the that was one that is that is one kind of gripe that there was a good chunk of the the shrines that were you know, major battle shrines, minor battle shrines, you know, battle shrines where you just go in and you know, defeat an enemy, you defeat a, f- basically just a freaking one enemy, one enemy and you're, you're done. Yeah. And it's like, really guys? Yeah. And when you, once you get the okay. ancient arrows, you can yeah. shoot one and be done and be it's done in a challenge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It. So yeah, that, that, the, the sameness of that part of it can be improved on. Um, or cut back on. Well, here's the thing. We have to remember, there's two specific things they did in this game because of the size of the world. The shrines and the Korok seeds. Mm-hmm. The reason they did them the way they did is, I'm sure they would like all of them to be super unique, but the reason that they even existed and existed in the numbers they did is they wanted to make sure there was always something to discover. Right. But here's my, and this is just my feeling after spending, you know, how many hundreds of hours playing the game, is that after a while, like, I'm only going to the shrine either because I'm trying to 100% the game or because I just want that warp point. Yeah. Yeah, there is that. It's not really because I care about discovering anything. And the Korok seeds especially, like there's yeah. some really fun ones to get. They legitimately are. But most of them are lift a random rock here. Yeah, right. Like there's and, so many rocks. It could have just literally put a Korok under every rock. It feels like there is, but they're not. Yeah. Like right. it, yeah. it's just one of those things where to me, um, I don't – my I I one of my favorite things in Breath of the Wild is the, is the exploration, but it's not by discovering like Korok seeds and shrines like that yeah, no. had nothing to do with my exploration. I wanted to see the vistas. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see what happened. You know, when you see like a rune here, I kind of want to go there and just kind of see like what what did this used to be I, instead of was this if, like a house at one right, point? Right. Like what happened? Yeah. And I have that unique curiosity. And there's no side quest or anything that's really built around no. it. But that's what I enjoyed about the exploration. It wasn't the oh, if I go to the top of this broken rune, I get a core. And I guess who cares yeah, about that? Right. Yeah. No. Besides, it be a thing that expands your inventory. I, I, I think instead of focusing on like so many shrines they could have put in a couple more towns sure and and, and have you go through that way i mean the sta- the stables are a nice touch they're again sames but mm-hmm. they're stables i mean you go to one stable you i mean gotta go to a wall, you got to go but so i mean i think there could have been more towns more, more been, people. Well, yeah. More, one, one thing that I, I do want to say is, with how big the world is, it would have been nice to see more travelers on the roads. Right. There were some, of course. Yeah. But they were more like, oh, we're just protecting the people. Like, okay, well, where is the actual, like, travelers? You have all these stables, and if it wasn't for me, nobody uses them. So, <laughs> well, I mean, much, people yeah. gather around yeah. them, sure. But, like, the whole point of stables to me would be because people travel, right? Well, where are all the travelers? Yeah, that... The world, in that, that sense, felt a little empty. Even though this is the world that had the most NPCs in Zelda history, it's kind of like... But when you're out there in the open overworld, they're not there. It feels to me, and I know that maybe this is the way it was supposed to feel, that we were in the Bokoblin's world. Yeah. 
we're just visitors in the Bokelman's world. This yeah, is kinda. their this is their place, and we're invading. They had yeah. the, the more built up societies in some cases. They actually traveled. They were everywhere. They were out hunting and gathering, and the people are just chilling. Yeah, right. Yeah, I. So I thought they could have put a lot more towns in. I think that would have been that would have been a lot more nice. That would have been nicer. Um, maybe that's something they do in the in in future here. Well, I, and and travelers and people that just people to interact with and kind of. I mean, I. You well, know what? Here's my thing. Like, when you look at the at the flashback, there once was a massive like city kind of thing going on around Hyrule Castle that got destroyed and ruined. And I get a lot of people probably died and all that. Yeah. But in rebuilding everything, why it, it never felt like there was like a big bustling city. There kind of right. was. You could argue out in the desert. What is uh, there with the Gerudos? But again, that was just the Gerudos. There was obviously uh, Kakariko Village, but even that felt massive compared to every other place that you go to. And that really wasn't that big. It was this tiny village. Like where? Right. What became the new central hub? There never was one. Right. So how did we organize? Like how did we decide we needed all these different stables and stuff? Like mm-hmm. what? Well, who came up? With, like there's no central anything. Yeah. Everyone's just kind of independently doing their own thing, and it doesn't make any sense because that's not it, really how people do when they're rebuilding societies, right? And and yeah. and in a world where there's hardly anyone traveling on the roads, then there's just hardly anyone. Right. Because there really wasn't that many people at each location either, to be honest. I mean, no. I was fine with the number of people around the stable, but right. that's if there's people traveling. Mm-hmm. But when I go to like Kakariko Village and it's like, oh man, there's like 20 villagers. Like, okay. So you're telling me we had this big bustling city and then just thousands of people died and we never had kids again? Right. That's Yeah, it did kind of feel that way. <laughs> you know? I, I, yeah. I, what is there? Minor a, complaint, I know. What is there? Maybe 10 towns? I don't even know if there's ten. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. You have the one. Well, that you, you got you, the there, you got the four major cities with sure. the with the where you go to, yep. to get the four divine beasts. Yep. You have Kakariko Village. Yep. You have the one village that you help build. Yep. Yep. That's the side quest, optional side quest, but a really cool one. one yeah, of the best that is side, actually one of the, one of the best. Side, cool. Like it's a really long winded yeah. side quest, but it's it great. Is. Um, so that's is, six. Is that the, which one's the one where you, uh, the you, you can argue? Show you can the argue one. the Deco Tree area is kind of like a village for the, yeah, the, the for the for the Korok. So that's Koroks, seven. Yeah. Um, where's the one kid that you show the? Is that part of the Kakariko? Is uh, where you show the one kid the um, weapons, the the weapons kind of sir, um, or where you build your house? Where is your house at? The house that that is, you buy. Oh, the, what is build? that? Is what that, village is I that I think in? it's a Tenno or something that. Oh. So that's what eight. Yeah, eight. That that's a village. That that's not part of the divine beast. Um. Yeah, there might be maybe, eight to maybe ten. Eight to ten, and like, and that's fine if they were massive. Massive. Then they're not. But they're not. They're, they're all like tiny, small, dinky. Like no, like what? Okay, so we're restoring Hyrule. For who? And where? Where are the. I mean, we solved all the big issues with the divine beasts that are the four areas, and they seem all happy. So, what's the point of beating Ganon now? My question is: is is Link the only Hyrulean left? Well, I or, think they're all human. I think, no, no. You see, like at the stables in Kakariko Village, and they're all Hyrulean. Yeah, I, it, it just feels like there's no major. Well, it feels like the Hyruleans are wiped out, right? Which makes a little sense if, like, that's they well, all lived at Hyrule yeah, Castle, but right? That was it. There wasn't. There was the Kakariko right. Village, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Like that would make sense, I guess. But I don't know. But you'd figure there'd be a lot more runes around the castle. There's a ton. The whole thing's rune. What are you talking about? Yeah, it's nothing but yeah. runes. Yeah. The, you remember the one cutscene where the um the uh, the uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of them, the guardians when they're crawling all over the city. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. there was a big giant city. Yeah. I mean, big relative for Zelda. Right. You know, for The Witcher Three. That, like <laughs> yeah, one yeah. eighth of a city, but one eighth of a village. <laughs> you get a block. <laughs> um, but for Zelda, it would have been huge. I don't. I, it's just, it, it's something that that felt like the game maybe could do a little better with. And now that they have this world still, because if they're still using the same world, now they can maybe flesh it out more. Yeah. Maybe now that Ganon's gone, people feel the need to procreate. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know the village you built. Is it like? Does that become the new central hub? This high. You know, you'd be. You'd be Defeat again, and did we rebuild Hyrule Castle? Even though Hyrule Castle looks like it's about to fly off or something. Yeah, right. Um, I'm just very curious uh, what they're going to do with that. And for improvements, I mean, I this is one thing, and I brought it up in, in a standalone video, and I, I want to get your thoughts on it. Did you like the breakable item system? 
Yeah, to a certain extent. I wish there was a little bit more notice of when your item's going to break. But well, it says it's going, your item's getting weaker, and then you have like three. Three, three more attacks, attacks, yeah. So it gives you a little bit of notice, and you're like, oh, do I really want to break this right now? Right? Yeah, I I mean, it makes for a nice, diverse... You know, you have to you have to explore weapons. To, yeah, it forces you to use a bunch of weapons you might not And not just the Master Sword. Yeah. I mean And even then you're using the Master Sword until it like runs out and then you might right. not even use anything else until right. it comes back. So Right. Um I think I see I liked it. Um the only thing I wish that the game would have included it, and this is what I want to see in a sequel, is a way to reforge or like fix your weapons. So no, yeah. if you take out a Lionel and you have one of those super strong weapons, like, yeah, it's neat that, oh, I have to take out another Lionel to get a new one. But maybe you have an affinity for that one weapon, and maybe they offer weapon customizations where you can change colors and all yeah. that you come with your clothes. And it's like, you know what? This like It's broken, right? The weapon broke. But why isn't it fixable? Or you can reforge or, the one the one uh, thing in uh, the Zora domain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why can't we like do that with more weapons? Or you have to you have to f- repair it. It can't be broken. Once it's broken, it's done. Why? Well, I don't know about that though, because weapons break all the time, and then people get them reforged. Yeah. Okay. So he. Okay. So yeah. So you have to take it to the blacksmith before it gets broken to get the blueprint made, because you can't just you can't just Automatic, automatically create a, a thing. You have to have a blueprint. But where the weapons come from in the first place? Then the Lionels had their blueprint. Maybe you have to find a blueprint. Or Where's something. the Lionel Village where they're making? I don't know. Weapons. I, you know what I'm saying though. I, I I get what you're saying, but it's a video game mechanic. I don't think it really matters. All it matters is that there's a weaponsmith, and you gather whatever metals you need to repair the, the weapon or wood. Because we already gather yeah. metal and wood. It would be yeah. another use for the resources yeah. we're gathering. That, that, that is another thing, too. There are a lot of resources that... I mean, there's things to do with them and trades you can make in certain markets, like out in the Gruta Village, but, like, can we actually build something with this metal? It'd be sweet. Yeah. And, well, hey, being able to fix your weapons would, would just make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And maybe it was something they were considering that they just couldn't fit in because of time. I mean, it feels like weird to say because of time, but, like, they were got to remember, at one point they decided we're pushing in all the Switch, so mm-hmm. the game was basically done at that point for yeah. them to do that. So, right. Um, I uh, That's one thing that I, I think I, I like what the weapon-breaking mechanic. I know some people are going to say, oh, I want weapons to be more durable. I don't know. I mean, I, a stick breaking in two hits, it's a stick. Yeah. You're hitting, like, it might break in one in real life. So, like, that. Yeah. But, I mean, I get some other weapons where it's like, oh, I got this giant rusty sword. It breaks, every, like, the, the, the meme for Zelda, the Breath of Wild is, oh, I got this amazing, epic 99 plus attack sword. It breaks in 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, I get that. It probably shouldn't maybe be that fragile. But I think that's also where Forge can come into play, where you pick up a weapon, and instead of using it right away, you take it to the Forge, and you kind of, like, um, kind of like in uh, I'll, give, I'll give an example of this this isn't for durability reasons but in Secret of Mana you could take it to the weaponsmith your weapons and they could get powered up and they'd be able to do more damage and more of this but what if you take your weapon to a forger or weaponsmith or whatever here uh, before you start messing with it and they take that weapon and they like make it stronger you know they get the rust mm-hmm. off of it they they, they, they reinforce it and stuff like that. And suddenly it is a weapon that can last a lot longer. And, by the way, if it breaks, he can say, hey, look, if it does break, you know, you can bring it back here. It's, it's just going to we're gonna need a lot of materials to rebuild it, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you bring the core the core materials back or whatever, like whatever the glowy thing is that makes the weapon glow. Like bring that bring those pieces back and we'll reforge it or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's fine. I think that would have been a neat, and that is something that I'd like to see in this. In, in this. It's just a, a slight improvement. And Zelda's done this before. They had a weaponsmith in Majora's Mask for it was only again only for one weapon. In Breath of the Wild, they yeah. also technically had it for again one of that damn the one weapon yeah that you get uh, yep. that you get in Zora's Domain. Like oh you break it, bring it back, they'll reforge it. And I'm gonna set them like why is this the only weapon in the game you reforge? Yeah. Heck, and here's the thing: if they add reforging in, you know what they could finally do and not have it just be like oh we're just throwing this mechanic in because we don't want people to use them. have the master break. Sounds crazy. Yeah. Get it fixed. Yeah. Instead of having it go on a recharge. What the hell is a recharge? Yeah. I, that part didn't make any it, sense It was either. a complete, hey, we need to make sure people aren't just spamming Master Sword for every single well, boss yeah, fight. It's yeah. like, okay. 
I mean, even the Hylian shield eventually breaks. Like, it's okay to let it break if you can reforge. Right. Um, but whatever. Uh, and the better the weapon, the higher the cost. Well, yeah, obviously. The, the number um, of mats yeah. and everything. Heck, maybe you could have a whole crafting system where you can actually build weapons. That might be kind of neat. Yeah. Um, Minecraft it. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> like, if you, like, you pick up a stick and you're like, oh, it's just a stick. But if you pick up a stick and you pick up a rock... You can bash that rock on another rock and make it into a spear, and suddenly it's a different weapon. Wouldn't that be sweet? Or you, you pick up a stick and you pick up a a piece of rope or something, and you can make a bow. Yeah, or something. Or I don't a, know. It'd be cool to have a little crafting system. Um, other improvements I think I'd like to see for Breath of the Wild specifically. Breath of the Wild 2. Um, so I really like the cooking mechanic a lot. Mm-hmm. I, I think it was a really clever thing, and there's a billion and one recipes. Um I think what would be neat is just some improvements to the recipe books. Obviously, more recipes and more, more you know, different things you can make. Uh, but just like an understanding of this is just like an inventory thing where when you're scrolling over each um, item in your inventory, if it kind of just gave you like a, a little pop up that said like what the what recipes this item can be used for that you currently have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, when you're thinking of cooking, you don't have to, like, go to the recipe book, figure it out, and then grab the materials and throw it in. Instead, you can just be like, well, if I go over to the material, it tells me, oh, I can make this, 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 and this, with, and oh, and then it just says I need, you know, these, and then, then you can, like, you know, put your thing over and then select that individual recipe, and it can tell you the rest of the materials and if you have them. Right. And literally, instead of picking up each individual item, just click on that recipe where he picks he, up the items yeah. and throws them in the pot. That's, that's what I was actually going to suggest. As you were saying that, I'm like... I'm guaranteeing you, if I remember correctly, they don't have a place no, they to don't. They don't. You, you can actually pick just up select each, the, each thing individually. Yeah, and it would be nice. If it's like you have a recipe book. Just it. click on the yeah. just click on the recipe and just throw your stuff in. It's yeah. streamline it. Yeah, streamline it. Definitely. So, uh, I, yeah, I think you're right. There's some things that can be actually more streamlined too, like that. I can't, you know, think of a whole lot, but I know there is a few things that can be actually streamlined a little better. Too. So, do you like how the story was told? It's basically all yeah. all, all uh, memories. From yeah, the I yeah, mean, I, I, there's things discovered in the world too. Definitely thought it was it was interesting. I don't know if I've seen a whole lot of games that do it that way. No, there ha- there's not a lot outside of games that are like you know made where you lost your memory. Right, but like this is one where you don't have to see any of it. You can just get off of the main starter area and just go straight to Ganon and never yeah. see any of it. Right, it's crazy. Right, and, but people have done it, and it's kind of like. Okay, so the story is optional for once in a game. That's like never been the case, right? And, and now like, it's now it seems what, like it's setting a precedence of, guess what? Now you can go to the ball final boss if you want to. And I think you wait. Might, <laughs> I, well, and I think in this game, that's another thing in this one. I think it's going to be a little different. I don't think you'll be able to in, in the sequel. And this isn't me like what I want. This is just I don't think based on what we saw in the trailer that you'll be able to just fight the final boss right away. Um. I think it's going to be one of those things where um, that cutscene kind of made it look like that was the first time visiting that area. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's underneath the castle or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he comes back to life. Well, like, unless that's happening, like, immediately mm-hmm. at the very, like, when you boot up the game, that's the opening cutscene. Yeah, right. Uh, which would be weird if that was literally the opening cutscene. Um, then, uh, then, again, to me, I would to me it would them. be like, the, to me, that, that, that moment that we saw. And, and like having all the, like the light go to Link's hand or whatever the hell that means, that to me almost feels like a mid game plot twist. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this in Zelda before; they've had lots of mid game plot twists. So it's like, is the story going to be a little bit more linear even if the world's open? And it's that way because you're not even sure what. You, maybe it's because you're not sure what you need to do to necessarily. Like you're just trying to fix this village or fix this divine beast or fix this or fix that. You're you're just doing. You know, there's this ominous presence and you can't really figure it out. And the whole time you're just trying to figure shit out. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you and Zelda happen upon whatever. Um, and so I think the story is going to be different. Well, one way it's different is that if this is literally a direct sequel happening after the events, you have your memories back. Mm-hmm. The game has to presume you have them back anyways. Right. So Ooh. everything that you're seeing now is no longer a memory. This is actually happening now. The story has to yeah. be told in the present. Yeah, right, right. Could you imagine... If they went back into your save file and saw where you were at with your memories and only presented oh, yeah. so much of it, yeah, oh, oh, wouldn't it be crazy if you go in there and be like, "Oh, you haven't beat Ganon yet. You can't play." Oh, <laughs> yowzers! Go, go back and beat Ganon at least once before yeah. you can continue. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you didn't beat these divine beasts. Well, then the divine beasts in this game are still a problem. 
Yeah, you, you have to go back and fail. Oh, my God. Ooh. Ooh, oh, that, we got some meta game going on. That'd be interesting. We got some meta game going on now. Ooh. Man, I've never seen a game do that before. That'd be yeah. crazy. I mean, there has been, like, Mass Effect 2, affected by your decision in Mass Effect 1, so there has been games yeah. like that. But it's like, but it's not really your decisions. You can go back and do it. Yeah. Because it's not a decision. It's just, oh, you just haven't done that yet. But right. it'd be interesting if, to, if the second game morphed and changed based on what you did in the first. Yeah. Like, oh, did I, you beat Master Mode? You didn't have you didn't have your... You know what would be sweet? If you beat Master Mode, you don't have to unlock it in this next game. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't beat it yet, but let me tell you, I'll go I'll go just rush bum rush Ganon right now and take care of that. <laughs> no problem. I'm trying to one hundred percent. I don't really care. I'll go yeah. take out each divine beast, make it super easy, go kick his butt and then let's move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um uh, that's another and, thing too, like an improvement. I actually would like to see if there is a master mode or a harder difficulty, it not be paid DLC. Yeah. Be part of the game and unlocked yeah. from the start. Yeah. I I think it's possible that they just Granted, it, well, and it's a it direct sequel. Been, it so it's been. directly speaking to people who've already played Breath of the Wild. So you, you don't need to have the excuse of, oh, well, new players. It's a direct sequel, right? Unlock it. Part of me was wondering. Part of me is wondering if they and they shouldn't have gone the route of DLC. But part of me is thinking that they didn't have the, uh, well, the extended done difficulty yet. done yet. Yeah, I, I understand it not being done. Could have just been a free update. Right. It could have been a free deal, free patch. But. Right, people would have still bought the DLC anyways, just for the story. But alone, but so. again, it's it's one of those things that if you can make money off of it, true ending. If you can make money off of it, you're gonna make money well, off of it. <sighs> and to a certain extent, as a business, I can't, to a fault, blame them for I that. I, 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 no, no, trust me, I I can. It's, it's but bullshit. but it makes sense as a business. <laughs> it, <sighs> yeah, I. It. Is there anything else? I mean. Ah, oh, God. I could go on and on about this all day. Yeah. I, but I don't want to just keep like, hey, this is just the Nate podcast where I just list off 50 things. I can make that as an own video. Is there anything else that, like, you remember experiencing in the game where you're like, you know, it'd be nice if this was a little bit. I could already think of one thing. Oh, God. The freaking gyroscope. Of, yeah. Oh, it is. God. There it is. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Well, they're you. not going to get rid of motion controls, but what no. can they do to maybe make it more tenable? I, there's no rhyme or reason to it. I can be holding my switch like this, start the thing, and then move it this direction, and all of a sudden it goes this way. And I'm like, no, that doesn't make any sense. So here's my thing. Throw if they're going to have motion Tilt puzzles, it this way, all of a sudden it goes this way. And I'm like, I think no, an easy fix this is, because I think some of this is just the gyroscope gets off, um, is have it like maybe be default as OU motion, but have it be known that, well... If you hold down, say, the left trigger button or something, you can now use the right stick as the full motion. Yeah. So there's an option of just, hey, look, just use a stick. If it's if it's an issue, don't do not do it that way. Well, there was one where I had to completely, like, one puzzle where you had to completely flip a platform over. And I'm sitting here spinning my freaking switch, and the platform's only going, per, like, 90 degrees. And I'm like, this makes no sense. How? 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 How am I? And I'm literally flipping my switch 360 degrees multiple ways, and I'm like, and yet Labo VR works just fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm granted, like, that's what? head tracking with just the tablet, not the right, not the controller. But I'm like, this this makes no sense. There's no rhyme or reason to how it moves. I think part of it might have been um, that it was originally a Wii U game. So it wasn't properly designed for the Switch gyro. It was mm -hmm. more made so for whatever Wii U tech was using, which I I know was a gyro too. But you know, hey, different boards, different, different gyros. Yeah. Um, you know, gyros in. Well, just the I mean, thing the Switch did, could but, be, but, but but the gyros are also like uh, on Wii U, the gyros would be in the literal game pad. Yeah. With the screen that's managing the inventory, whereas the gyro in this is in, in the, the individual controllers. controllers. Each yeah. controller has right. its own, and right. then also the tablet has its own. So it's kind of like. Which one do you listen to? Which one to? are you listening to? Are you, if you're just using the head one, but what if people are playing in TV mode? How does that work? Well, then which controller is the one that's doing it? Is it the right or is the left? Oh, well, if they're both in the thing, do you use both of them to make it more accurate? Whereas before, it's like, look, it's all in one thing. It's either yeah. all in the Pro Controller. Right. It's all in the Wii U yeah. gamepad. There's a lot more variables, and I, I just wonder if they just picked one or one, you know, left or right controller, or, and they just said, screw it. Yeah, it's you possible. Know, and, and so it's just not as accurate as it would be with the whole thing. Honestly, though, they should be able to tell... Well, Whether or not so you're shots. playing in, no, oh, no, 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 Two. no. They should be able to tell if the the Joy Cons are connected or not. 
in an ideal world, yes, but in a game that was spent its entire life being built on a different platform, yeah. that was probably not right. something they right. really fully tested. Yeah. If I was like, hey, look, oh, look, it turns, cool. It it turns. Did yeah. anyone did anyone even beat the game? I said, oh, but it turns. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, yeah, obviously so that, it wasn't like not beatable. Yeah, it's you're just, right. I it's can't, just frustrating at times where it's like, I know what to do. Just do it, please. Yeah, I, you're right. I don't know how the hell I didn't think of that one. Oh my god, yeah, that was that was that was pissing me off a whole ton when we were at freaking E3. So another thing I can think of is climbing. Um, I loved it. Love oh, the stamina stuff. It's yeah, fine. No. I like that. That limits your exploration a little bit. And makes you feel like you're progressing as you get. More and more stamina. That's cool. I don't know if you're going to start this game. Chances are you're not going to start this game with everything. You start all over again with your health and yeah. everything. That's usually what happens. But um, it would be interesting if, like, because, you know, you're climbing in the rain. It's a, okay. Yeah. It's really hard to climb in the rain. You can't really climb at all. It would be nice if you could somehow find, like, an item that lets you kind of climb in the rain. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it's just temporary. Even if it, like, halves your stamina, but you yeah. can still climb for half yeah. that stamina before it's like, oh, no, nope, can't do it now. Because it is supposed oh, to be harder. I, to me, it felt like any time I went to climb, it was always raining. It was like, Well, some places were like that intentionally, though. There were areas yeah. where, like, it's going to rain until you beat it. And that's part of the challenge of that area. Right. Um, and that's fine. But- Obviously, it's not spelled out because, hey, it's an open world game. And I can tell right, you that. You right. just kind of realize that there was the one area. I remember the one tower um, that it would rain, it would rain, it would rain nonstop until I got to the one point where I where there was, like, all this muck. And you get to the top of, finally get to the top of this one Bokoblin camp. And then you grab, like, halfway up the tower and then it stopped raining. And it's like, oh. So, yeah. you need, it just didn't want me to just... Float, float off a hill onto this thing, climb up it. Like it yeah. wanted me, it wanted to present a challenge to this tower because I could have made this tower a joke. Right. I, okay. Yeah. I I guess I get like it's trying to, and, and that's something that you know they were try, that Nintendo I guess was trying to tackle in this open world concept with Zelda is how do we make it so people just don't skip everything and make it all a joke? Mm-hmm. Like unlocking towers, it's the same thing every time, right? Climb up, be yeah. done. Okay, cool. So how do we make it different? Well, sometimes we put spikes on the tower. Sometimes it's... How do we make it so people can't cheat it? And even then, it can always be cheated once you realize, oh, I can attach those dang um, octo balloons and just float up anyways. Yeah. So, like, you could could cheat it still anyways. Yeah. So... You know, it's kind of a a, a give or take thing. But then again, that's that's another puzzle you have to figure out. And I think that... But I think that was the thing is them... Trying to make it so you have to think more critically. I don't, I don't know. It's just, it just it always feels like yeah. for some odd reason, whenever I have to go climb, it's right. It doesn't matter where yeah, I am because you'll you'll, you'll, you'll be, be climbing. Like, you'll be like an hour, yeah. hour and a half where you're not even really climbing besides the little tiny things, and all of a sudden you finally go, all right, I actually kind of want to climb up this mountain. Rain. Yeah. Right. It, it's okay, like the you game knows. And, and the thing is, yeah, you can make a little campfire if you can find a place that isn't wet. Yeah, right. And then you can like fast forward time, but you know to try to get rid of the rain. But it's like, man. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. I get like I, I like the living, breathing world like that. They no, no, rain's for sure. Unpredictable. It's just like, eh, but it's a little. It feels like it rains more towards. Well, the amount of times it rains in certain areas, I'm like, why is this a rainforest? Yeah, right. If I'm in a rainforest, I expect that. Right. Well, like when I'm just like out in a Midwest place, like yeah, it rains sometimes. Not <laughs> all the time. Three weeks in a row. Oh, <laughs> that'd be interesting. If they just randomly threw tornadoes in there. Well, new weather effects. New weather effects. Because they have lightning strikes. Yeah. Why not tornadoes? That'd be interesting. So, oh, what if the tornadoes could also destroy buildings? That would be crazy. Yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd have, have to dodge tor- tornadoes and stuff. and That would be sick. Or if you're like on the ocean, there could be like a hurricane, typhoon, typhoon or hurricane coming yeah. in. Yeah. Oh. Surfing. Surfing. <laughs> had surfing. Actual surfing. We had surfing Pikachu. We had, we had shield surfing, not had real surfing in there. <laughs> You still should surf on your shield. <laughs> yeah, you jump off the cliff and then ride the wave. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's going to work. I mean, yeah. it might work with a wood shield, I suppose. You have surfing Pikachu. Now you have surfing, surfing. Link. <laughs> uh, there, there's just a lot of l- little things I think could be done better. Big things, obviously, would be dungeons. Telling yeah. the story different, making maybe more linear. I don't know. Um, obviously, there's things people want to see, improve visuals, improve frame rate. I think frame rate will be better in that I think it'll be a locked 30 FPS. Yeah. Um, it was at 30 a lot of times after all the patches, but there's still some times that you can get it to dip. Uh, and I think a lot of that is just, hey, it was a Wii U game. Right, right. And I think for sure that they're going to update the uh, engine to yeah, be... Yeah, a little bit. Op- they're they're going to optimize this, this thing like, like crazy. The, 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 it should be running probably at a rock solid 30. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know what resolution you're going to get, but uh, I'm assuming 1080p and 720, but I don't know because Mario Odyssey was 900. So, But again, Mario Odyssey also might have been originally a Wii U game that was ported because it came so early in the yep. Switch's life cycle. Yeah, that they just never told you it was a Wii U game because yeah, it never it came never, out of Wii U. It was never announced. So maybe they were planning to announce it at E3 after, and then they're like, oh, we're actually going to push Zelda for Switch. Well, Let's do the same thing. Let's not yeah. even announce Mario Yeah, right now. let's do the same thing. I could very well see that. Uh, so... It'll be interesting to see what 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 they do with that. Um, there's just oh, oh, man, man. They could. I, I I'm gonna start getting like super nitpicky in, in the little voice acting. Yeah. I like the voice acting in the game. I know some people don't. My only issue with the voice acting. Two issues. One issue is the that I think every, every character in the game should be voiced all the time. I don't think there's any excuse for any characters not to be voiced. It happens in The Witcher. It happens in every single Western RPG ever made. Why can't we do it in Zelda? Yeah. It's bigger than a lot of these Western RPGs. Yeah. It makes more money. These, like, why can't we? Why? I, okay. That's one I, thing. I, but. I, as here, an introduction to voice acting and stuff like that. But here's but here's my one issue with the introduction. of It's like, fine, okay. It's only the major characters. and blah, blah, blah. My issue is it's only the major characters when it's convenient to have them do it. Mm-hmm. When you just go up and talk to them, they're not voice acted. No. So it's like it really broke immersion to me. Like, oh, Sidon, you're fully voice acted. Then we actually get to Zora Village and you don't talk anymore. Right. We don't talk anymore. Right. We don't talk anymore. That's no, like, no. Yeah. No, I get you. You are now. fully yeah. voice. Like, why can't we have ever? Like, I understand there's a billion lines. Who cares? Every every RPG and adventure game ever that has voice acting has to deal with a billion lines. And they're not using, like, big-name Hollywood actors. Here's the thing. And, like, The Witcher 3 devs can hire Keanu Reeves to do, you know, 10,000 lines. And then take these professional voice actors you did hire and just have them do more. Yeah. Yeah. I Have them do multiple characters. Yeah. that's. I mean, that's... I mean, one of them actually did do multiple characters. But yeah. it's still, it's... <sighs> no, it, I get you. It's I get something you. that, if you're going to have voice acting, fine. I gave him a pass because it's the first Zelda game really with voice acting, and no, I'm not counting. Yeah, or <laughs> hey, listen. Oh God! Like, I mean, actual Shut voice up, acting. You stupid little thing. But I want to see it just blow up well beyond what 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 it was. Go all the way. Yeah. No. Um. <laughs> voice act the bulk of wins. <laughs> Wait. All right. So. I'm going to kind of shift gears a little bit. You guys can tell us some in the comments uh, what you want to see improve Breath of the Wild. As I said, I, I actually could make a video of 50 things I'd like to see better in Breath of the Wild too. But um, I, I, <laughs> I told myself I was going to give myself a break from Breath of the Wild content. Then here we are. This thing's releasing publicly on Monday, and I just did a Breath of the Wild video two days ago. I can't help it, okay? I this am a big is, Zelda guy. And, and the game's amazing. Yeah. And, and it was probably one of the biggest announcements and Breath of the Wild to, to us. Biggest announcements at E3. So... So. You guys saw my reaction, right? 11,000, yeah, right. 12,000 views. You guys just keep, keep watching it over and over and over again on repeat. Well, I, I, I really think it's it's because you yelled at Doug Bowser. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Doug Bowser. No one wants to hear you. I really think it's because you yelled at Doug but Bowser. I can't even do it the yeah. same as I did yeah, because right? it was such a moment of oh, passion God, yeah. Oh, yeah. in that. Like, sh- like you got to watch it. I don't can't believe it hasn't been memed. Fully. There are some people in the comments I mentioned, like, it needs to be fully memed. It was oh, great. Yeah. And I can't meme it. I'm not going to make a meme of myself. Someone else has got to meme it for right. me. But, right. um. So I want to shift gears a little bit and just talk a little bit about um, game journalism, YouTubers, uh, our role in it, um, because there's been a lot of stuff that's been coming out that I haven't really talked about because I'm not sure how to really approach a conversation around it. So a little background is basically traditional media is coming after YouTubers again. No, no shocker, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and traditional media is doing dumb things too, which they do, but YouTubers aren't exactly innocent either. So there's been, um, I, I guess hit pieces going on out there starting to CNET net then followed up by some other oh, places. Yeah. They went, went after like young. Yeah. Uh, went after clean Prince gaming. I think Jim Sterling a little bit, uh, went after the quartering and a whole angry bunch of other Joe. people, angry Joe. Um, and some, some of these people made response videos and some of them didn't. Uh, and there's theories out there about, Oh, well, you know, so-and-so didn't comment on it. So, and they were the ones that were hit the, le- the least in the pieces. It's a conspiracy. Whatever. Think what yeah. you want. It was a hit piece on YouTubers and you can think what you want of the YouTubers I brought up. It's fine. I don't really care if you like any of them or don't, or you love them all or you hate them all. I don't really care. That's neither here nor there. The point is that the hit piece itself brought up a lot of factual inaccuracies. Um, I think the hit pieces had a general point mm-hmm. that I think is something worth talking about, but the way they targeted it 
and the specific examples they bring up and the way they twisted the interviews. Also, the way they presented the interview itself. Oh, yeah. They lied to the people they were trying to get interviews from saying it wasn't a hit piece. And then they twisted the words and omitted things. And it just very like even boogie 298 was interviewed for one of them and like they twisted his words and used them way out of context and made things like it, it's just like boogie 298 i think put out the videos that i accidentally helped the hit piece and like mm-hmm. i did yeah, right right but, and, like, they and the thing is i don't think i don't i think there's a there's an understanding between the youtubers that were hit by this yeah. that because they well, were i'm pretty sure they were all approached well, for the piece yes every single one was was asked by somebody i think from cnet not necessarily the original author, but someone representing CNET, and then and they were told they were they were told it was a normal interview, and then you know by the time you get into the interview and you start realizing that, and you know because I'm sure this, the interview started out as a normal interview, well, like like Boogie Two Ninety Eight actually went in depth on it, talking about how hey like they were asking him questions about certain things with YouTubers, and you could definitely tell like they have like a slanted. Mm-hmm. Um, slantedness to the questions, but then he said, like, I spent a lot of time like explaining, well, here's why this perception exists, and mm-hmm. like, here's what we as YouTubers are doing about it, here's what you don't understand about YouTube, about mm-hmm. the algorithm, and about how viewership works, right. and blah, 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 and positive videos versus negative videos, right. and like, some of it is built around the audience more so than it's built around the individual YouTuber, and like, there's a right. whole whole big conversation that he tried to have with them to make them, make them understand, hey, look, a unique opportunity to talk to a traditional media and try to make them understand, mm-hmm. and so they just picked out the pieces that make all YouTubers look bad, and then mm-hmm. threw that in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I don't really care if you like Boogie Two Nine Eight either. Heck, I don't care if you like me. If you're listening to the video, I assume you don't mind me at this point, uh, especially this far into the podcast. But uh, wait, that was an option. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think that um, when you're sifting, when you're wading through all this, regardless of your opinions of individual YouTubers, uh, what's very clear is that. Um, one traditional media is obviously scared of YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, I, taking away a lot of their viewership. Uh, you can go look at uh, Google Trends and all this, and you'll okay. see IGN, GameSpot just nose diving in terms of search term relevance, and you'll see YouTube just skyrocketing. Um, and I know you know you can even search individual YouTubers like PewDiePie skyrocketing past everyone. And regardless of what you think about him, the bottom line is he probably has a bigger poll right now than the whole of IGN. Um, and that's not even just, that's just looking at YouTube. That's not counting his Instagram and his Twitter with all the millions of additional followers he has, um, and different ways to reach people. Cause we all know YouTube's algorithm isn't always the greatest of reaching <laughs> the people who actually want to see our videos. Um, <laughs> hello to the half of people that won't see this. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello to the, we have 4.3 thousand people who hit the bell. Hello to the 300 of you that maybe got a notification. Right. <laughs> and the 50 of you that actually clicked on it and care about the podcast. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting because I I think the conversation should have been around why is negativity popular? Like why does that getting clicked? It even gets clicks on these websites. Like mm-hmm. even this article, oh, yeah, yeah. it's negative. Yeah. yeah, it's created to get clicks, and they know it's going to get clicks. It's very clickbaity. So what? Why is negativity not just on YouTube but in general more uh, appealing to viewers? And positivity. I don't. At my channel, it's in. At my channel, it's interesting. One of my most. How, how do I put this? Mine's like the inverse of that at my channel. So it's not that positivity gets more views than negativity, um, but positivity about something towards Switch that happens to also have this negative connotation towards Switch haters gets a ton of views. Yeah. So. Which are, which are three, and being impressive, and this and that, blah, 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 12,000, 20,000 views. Oh, Switch has thwarted hackers. Well, it's negative towards hackers, positive towards Nintendo. 300,000 views. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but if anything, I just make it straight positive. Just, yeah. they're, 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 it doesn't negatively impact anyone. If I, if I come out and say something, you know, like, like oh, uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 might be my game of the year. Mm-hmm. And that's nothing negative against anyone else. That's just a personal preference, yeah. positive opinion on Luigi's Mansion 3. Oh, yeah, I might get two, 3,000 views. Where's the 10, 12, 15? Because yeah. there's nobody negatively impacted by that opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, what do you, why do you think negativity is like this big thing with people? Why do we I, inherently want to click on negative and not positive? God, I mean, I think a lot of it... Do we just like drama? Yeah. There's the, the drama aspect, the everyday news even on like television everything like that is generally 
all things that have gone wrong, bad things. You see a, f- a nice fluff piece, great things here yeah, and there. Yeah, so oh, this kitten. Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. Too. It's like right. Everyone likes kit, cat videos. But for the, for the part, but. I mean, but for the most part, your news is, well, there was a shooting here. The weather took care of this town. The took um, out this town. Yeah, it took out this town. Um, this and that, and it's all generally negative bad things and uh, it's rare to turn on any any news any like any those news. are the major news outlets like yeah. like and see positive everywhere yeah you might find one in the slew of 30 bad ones right right and I, I don't know if that's just a habit that we've gotten into so we're we're i also think there's a morbid curiosity sure to a certain extent of okay this person's getting crapped on Let's see why they're getting crapped on, or it, or the it's one of those things that you know it's kind of almost rubbernecking where you drive by an accident and you kind of can't peel your eyes away from mm-hmm. it. So it's kind of one of those things too. It's it's our inherent. Do you think some of it has to do with outrage culture? <laughs> that we're always looking for something to be angry at. To a certain extent, I I think as it grows, yes, I I I, I feel the way the world is going. I think yes. That's, well, here, that's it, starting to go. Here's something come I want to make clear about outrage culture, and the, obviously, it's all personal opinions. I don't think outrage culture is always bad. No, um, I think a lot of times um, we talked about this in the past. Video games, uh, how they can be a great escape from life, and I think finding something to be angry at that really isn't that big of a deal to us on a on a deeply personal level. As an example, getting mad at 2K for putting um, ads that are unskippable in in NBA 2K19. People will get outraged and really pissed about it, even though it's been around forever. It just finally came to Switch. And it's a justified thing to be upset about. Is it justified to be super angry and having your veins pop? Not really. In the grand scheme, it's a video game. It's not really yeah. worth being that angry about. But some people might get that way because they're directing the frustrations they have in other aspects of their life into something that ultimately isn't going to hurt them for being frustrated with. Mm-hmm. You could be just pissed off at 2K about this, but it's better to be pissed off at that than yell at your kids. Right. No, so, definitely. And because hey. I know for, for me sometimes, I personally, when I'm really, really frustrated, I'll be browsing on YouTube and I'll click on the first negative video that has a topic I'm interested in mm-hmm. just so I can like direct my anger at something. Yeah. Yep. Um, and a lot, I th- again, a lot of this has to do with anonymity. Sure. You can go out there and blast away and get all your negative feelings out at something and not put your name on it. Sure. You know, you don't have to worry about. Uh, for so the I'm, most part, everything I do is public. So for the for the most part, you That's don't have to worry about your your it coming back to hurt you. For yeah. the most part, especially if you're really smart about it. There's right. ways. To, there's ways to hide yourself enough that no one's gonna right. No one's really gonna figure it out. Um. Yeah, I, and I, I think uh, a lot of these like these hit pieces towards YouTubers they focus on the fact that on YouTube. Outrage culture and negativity is what gets the most clicks. It just does. I even just mentioned, even in my positive ones, it's always the positive ones that's negative towards somebody else that equals out to... And the thing is, is I don't th- necessarily think that's all on the YouTubers. That's partially on YouTube itself. Yeah, sure. Because that's how their algorithm is set up. The There's more eye-catching words in the negative direction, I feel, than there are in the positive direction. Sure. So you're going to see more words that are negative connotation than you are positive, and they're going to push that. They know that, and they want the views. They want the they well, want the ad rec- revenue. They want this. They want that. Here's one thing I'll always say, too, th- that YouTube and Google and all this stuff, even Facebook, everyone – bases what they share to you based on what you are clicking so a lot of it is self-inflicted you are choosing to click on negative stories so they're going to show you more negative stories and if you keep clicking on those negative stories they're going to keep showing you more and more and it's going to start feeling like all youtube is is a place of negativity right. whereas if you're someone who's only clicking on positive and all you get is positive stories you'll view youtube as a completely positive place because they exist there right. are youtubers that do nothing but positivity right and uh, we just always look at it as, oh, it doesn't get a lot of views. And like even for me, like I can be like, oh yeah, I don't, you know, I'll, I'll give you a prime example of a, of a YouTube channel that's almost always positive and is the most successful Nintendo YouTube channel out there. Game Explain. Mm-hmm. Everything they do is basically positive. Mm-hmm. They rarely have a criticism towards Nintendo mm-hmm. or anything. 
I mean, yeah. And when they do, it's drowned up with so many other positive videos that doesn't matter. Right. Even when people disagree, it doesn't matter. So, like, that's an example of, like, if all you do is click on Game Explain positive videos, you're, all you're going to do is get Nintendo positive videos shared to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and my channel, as much positive as there is, there's negative because um, it, it's actually hurt my channel, if I'm being completely honest. Um the reason my channel is doing so well here during June is not just from the E3 content. It's because it's all positive content. Mm-hmm. And Nintendo fans, I think, have this innate ability where they want to subscribe to channels and watch channels that are positive towards what they're into. Mm-hmm. Even if they disagree with the opinions, they like the positive coverage because there's so much in it. It's almost the anti. But every time I put out a critical video, it might get more views, but I'll lose subscribers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting just watching how, how that ebbs and flows. Oh. <laughs> people, oh, all these powers. Oh, you put up that one negative video that cost me 50 subs. Like why? Yeah. Or, or are you just, ha- or does it just happen that you pop out these negative videos on a, on a purge from YouTube? <laughs> yeah, I could I have no idea. YouTube's purges are a mystery. They always let you know about it three weeks after they did it. It's like, uh, why don't you they, let me know beforehand well, so is, I don't think something's it's, it's wrong it's always happening it's just when they're when are they going to hit you harder yeah you know? it's like it'd be nice to know about this beforehand so I'm not panicking that I'm thinking something's going wrong you mean, you mean them in communication yeah Something. right yeah um, I mean you mean the communication where you started the you started a chat with them and then they told you that they were going to email you and then they said you didn't respond in the chat because they said you were going to email you yeah but it, was mean an automa- that? it was an automated email clearly but it's kind of like but I did chat. You told me you couldn't solve my problem, so we'll email you. And they emailed and me to tell me they couldn't solve it. And this yeah. email because you didn't, didn't respond, respond in the chat. It's like, yes, I did. Yeah. But that's neither here nor there. I think, um, I don't know, like, what, what are your thoughts on, here, here's my thing. I'm, I'm weird, okay? So I think the general opinion of most YouTubers is that traditional media it's kind of slipping, and that's why we matter. Well, I also think, though, there is there's also the traditional media. You generally go to their websites, and it costs money to view their articles. Some I could the gaming the, ones usually aren't the case. Right, right, right. But uh, like Wall Street Journal, sure. your your major. Well, they're print also media. they're also a newspaper too. Right, so right. Kind of makes but more sense. It does. But you go to YouTube; it's all free. For the most part. Yeah, ads. But, I mean, there's ads even on those websites that you pay for sometimes. Too. Right. For the most part. So, I mean, you can ignore the YouTube Red. You don't have to get the you don't have to get the premium that cuts out well, your ads. Well, I mean, yeah. And there's, like, there's YouTube originals that are behind that as well. But, um, for the most part, YouTube is a community-based website um, that we happen to make money on. So, I, I think that that's obviously an appeal. Uh, that's one reason why YouTube still matters, even though Netflix blew up and everything else. Yeah. Because... Doesn't cost anyone anything. Any everyone can watch YouTube. Anyone can be on YouTube. Right, and I, I think part of that, part of that on YouTube, yeah, it, it's nice to kind of show you similar videos and stuff like that. But I wish there was a way that instead of giving you a list of, you know, if you kind of keep clicking in the negative direction, mm-hmm. you kind of snowball yourself into a corner. Sure, but that I, happens on Netflix too. They yeah, do, like I, literally I, everything out there, it bases what they're going to show you and suggest to you based on what you previously have done. I I wish there was a section kind of in the, in the, how it, how it, sh- what shows you where, you know, there's a majority of what, sh- you know, based on your stuff, but there's still other options. It, it feels like the whole like recommended for you is literally what you're looking uh, like, what you've been snow, you know, if you snowball and I want to go see a, uh, you know, a happy piece or something. I have to like literally search for it. I can't find it in the recommended mm-hmm. for you. Where if like a like three quarters of your recommended for you was what you've looked for, and then they had kind of a similar but in the opposite direction mm-hmm. of what you're looking for, that would be interesting. I mean, I think that would help you to maybe not feel like YouTube is only one direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's. Just it's an interesting conundrum to me because YouTube's got a lot of issues in that of itself, and just this is not just a YouTube, Facebook, every, everywhere is like right. this. Um, Twitter, I think, is the one place where uh, even then they they try to curate your feed. You could still, I always set it to latest tweets, but it I, keeps resetting and curating. I know your feed, that it drives me which is absolutely Facebook bonkers. It, uh, anyways, uh, but when you just set the latest tweets, it's fine. But I mean, uh, you know, when it curates, it's curating based on what have you clicked on or what do you liked and respond. It's like. 
anyways, so I said every even Twitter is trying to do it. So my my whole uh, uh, shtick here though is more so negativity. Why why it's a thing, and then why traditional media feels like they need to come after YouTubers so much, and why YouTubers conversely feel like they need to go after traditional media mm-hmm. because we're just as guilty as they are. Yeah. Um, and we know, like, I literally, one of my top viewed videos at Nintendo Prime is me complaining about an article at Polygon. It's yeah. one of my top viewed videos. Yeah, I stand by that video. I don't regret making it, but it's one of those things that's like, but that's proof of me doing exactly what this hit piece. I did a hit mm-hmm. piece on them. They did a hit piece on other YouTubers. Like, okay, we're hit piecing each other. It depends on how it's how it's framed and well, how and how it was presented. I'll give you, I'll give you an example, and, and this is... Because Maybe this is like why YouTubers do what they do. GameSpot put out an article this past week about bra sizes because of a character in Final Fantasy VII looked like her boobs were a little smaller than they were in the original Final Fantasy VII uh, when the real reason given by the developers isn't that they're smaller. It's that you know in the original game she was wearing like a traditional bra and this one she's wearing more of a sports bra which is more akin to what a person who's doing a bunch of action would be wearing. It's more realistic, mm-hmm. I guess, mm-hmm. is a good way to put it. And she still has pretty big tatas, so it's, I don't really know what the big deal is. Yeah. And but hardly anyone even, like, only, like, the vague, like, edge of the gaming internet said anything even about it. Mm-hmm. Nobody gave a crap about this person's boob sizes in the grander scheme of gaming. It was very edge comments mm-hmm. or joke comments, maybe. Mm-hmm. And they decided to make a whole article around about how gamers are outraged over it and explaining how bras work. That is an entire article that exists on GameSpot. And I found out through this that IGN actually owns GameSpot now. So oh. that's a thing. So they're oh. one and the same, basically. So, All right. Okay, cool. So whatever. That's fine. They're not competing Oh, so anymore. is that why IGN wasn't at E3? Because GameSpot was there? <laughs> and now next year GameSpot's not going to be there and IGN's going to be there? Who knows? Um, but I, I just found that interesting because that piece – Clickbait as hell. They knew they were going to get millions and millions of people clicking on it just because it's such a dumb, controversial uh, topic mm-hmm. that is completely irrelevant and that people are going to click because it's irrelevant. And then you, they had to have known that, of course, YouTubers are going to respond to it because they're going to be like, this is an embarrassment. This is stupid LOL game journalism. Um, and personally, I like when stuff like that happens, it's like, well, that's why we go after them. And then they'll look at us and be like, well, so and so did this controversial thing, and that's why we go after you. But why, this, I want us to coexist. I don't right, think right. we replace traditional media. Um, traditional media has a little bit of false sense of itself sometimes. I'll give you an example. Jason Schreier respects some of his work. He says some dumb things sometimes. He is what he. I, we all have our beliefs and our things that we that are just dumb sometimes. Uh, but he he did that whole debate with Yang Ye last year. Yang Ye last year, sorry, and. It was an interesting conversation, and all of his responses to Young Yab were basically, well, like, why don't you interview them? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And Young Yab just keeps saying, I don't have that kind of access. They don't view YouTubers the same way they view you. And he's just like, well, yeah, right. sure they do. No, they don't. Look at, look at your reach. You can get whatever you want. And, like, there's this thing with traditional media, like, look, if you're this big on YouTube, you should have the same access we do. And reality is we don't. No. Because... The developers and the publishers don't view YouTubers the same as traditional media because right. we're not we're not I mean, educated in the same way. Can you really trust us? They don't they don't want. They're afraid of YouTubers because because we aren't vetted, we aren't educated per se necessarily with the official journalism degree. We don't have a big corporate entity to answer to that if we get an interview that we are going to and, – and by the way, there have been interviews, of course, but they're far and few between in general with YouTubers. And they feel that we might trap them into saying something um, when in reality that's what journalists do too. Right. Also, I think there's a par- par- part of it that's – YouTube's a visual media, mm-hmm. whereas um, print media – yeah, I mean – it's you know what I'm you know what yeah. I'm, you know what I'm saying, um, where there's an actual video involved. Sure. If you know a YouTuber comes in, they're gonna want to generally sh- to show something. You can't show that in a newspaper, unless it's like or well, print media, unless there, it's like a you and know, there's also photos or where some journalists have been doing have been doing interviews so and they know like oh you can't ask this question, right? Like it's gonna be off limits. We just know it going in. Yeah. Or as a YouTuber, I'm gonna ask anyways. Right. Like what are they gonna do? Not, not interviewing or whatever. They weren't interviewing with me anyways. Right. Yeah. I. 
and it's going to be video. So like right. you can't hide, you can't like hide your intonation. I'm putting it out there in video because right. like you agreed to this. Yeah. Right. No, for sure. You, for know, sure. you can't ask me after the fact not it, to show it. You can't. You can. Yeah. I'm not, I don't have to listen though because yeah. that wasn't what we agreed upon. Right. So like I and I think that's where traditional media has a running with YouTubers. Like, look, you're not educated. You don't. You're not. The, there's a superiority complex. Yeah. Where you haven't been, in, you don't understand the industry as long as. But hey, look, well, we you, haven't know, had you a should you to. should ask for the access. We yeah, we can give review copies of games, but we're not getting the interviews. We're, no, well, I mean, mean sometimes we'll get invited out to early gameplay events, but they won't talk to you. They treat you differently than the Kotaku's and I mean, the IGNs. Even just look at E3's requirements to get in, or they'll ask you to come. Here's here's a good one. So and by the way, I don't think that you know you can argue about shill this and that, but like. X Company, I, I don't want to get too deep into it because this breaks some NDAs if I go too, too deep, but X Company invited some YouTubers and some traditional media out to preview a game before E3. Fine, great, great, cool. Everyone's being treated equal. Those YouTubers had to buy their own flights, buy their own, own hotels, buy their own food, um, and got to attend to play the game. They got to ask a, a few questions here and there, but that was it. The traditional media had their flights paid for by that company, had their hotels paid for by that company. And also, all of them were offered interview opportunities. Yowzers. Now, they all have to play the same demo, but they're already like, oh, yeah, we're bringing YouTubers into the culture, but we're not going to fully ingrain them. And granted, I'm not saying that they should be paying because you could argue that can create a bias because mm-hmm. they're paying for everything. And I get that maybe, you know, the YouTubers are actually less biased in that way for this particular company and game, but it's one of those situations where at least, like, have equal treatment. Like, you're showing yeah. that they're like, oh, yeah, YouTuber this, YouTuber that, but hey, these are the people that are going to be a Metacritic. Mm-hmm. Not these YouTubers. Mm-hmm. These are, are Metacritic. So we're going to treat them like royalty. And the other guys, like, yeah, you can come play if, just because you have an audience. But mm-hmm. Right. No, I get you. So I don't know. I, I think that's going to do it for this week's podcast. You guys let me know what you think about all this stuff as well down in the comments. There's, there's so much stuff going on in this in this world of video. And I like having these conversations. And maybe we'll continue it on a live stream at some point. So then we can have more direct communication. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Be sure to support us at patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime. A whole bunch of tiers. Check them all out. Uh, audio versions are typically available on Podbean, iTunes, uh, NintendoPrime.net, uh, that's, and the Google Play app uh, mm-hmm. for podcasts and stuff in the Google App Store. Uh, right now, we're a little iffy on, on, on the audio versions. I'm a little behind. i got to get them updated. But once they're updated, it should be updated at some point this week. Uh, you'll have them all available to you guys. Uh, and, hey, you'll have, you'll have to listen to like, two podcasts in a row because we have two podcasts worth of audio versions to put up for you guys so mm-hmm. thank you guys for tuning in things have been crazy welcome to uh post e3 lots <laughs> of crazy stuff happening hey did you hear the cuphead developers want to make a zelda game oh yeah yeah i mean it's crazy we didn't even talk about that like cuphead developers want to make a want to make a 1930s style zelda Dude, game that sounds that, that me, picture that picture yeah, that they put out there was yeah. fan for fantastic nintendo come on come on you let cadence of hyrule happen i think it's time i think it's time for cuphead of hyrule or whatever you're gonna call it <laughs> Zelda, Zelda, <laughs> Zelda. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> All right, thank you guys for tuning in. <laughs> done, <laughs> done. <laughs> we'll done. catch you on the podcast uh, next. Oh, like, subscribe, share. Of course. I mean, <laughs> that's a thing. That's a thing we do, right? Yeah. You might Why see not? a video. <laughs> you might <laughs> later again. <laughs>